So we're interested in how climatic controls influence the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. And in order to look at this further, what we've done is couple a very simple model of global climate, this is a moist energy balance model, to a model of the exogenic global carbon cycle. So what happens here is that we feed the energy balance model, if you look at this top panel, we feed it some representation of geography, and that includes information like where albedo is high versus low. And we also feed it a global representation of atmospheric CO2. And what the model spits out then are spatial representations of temperature and hydroclimate fluxes. And changes in these two things with atmospheric CO2 can be indicative of radiative feedbacks or can reflect what's happening with radiative feedbacks that are embedded within the moist energy balance model. And then these two terms are used to drive the carbon cycle model, with, which gives us a spatial representation of weathering fluxes. And the changes in these weathering fluxes with CO2 provides us with insight to geochemical feedbacks like the silicate weathering feedback. So today we're going to focus on two things. If you scroll down to the text below, we'll look at radiated feedbacks like the ice albedo feedback, where uh, the plant, land, land surface basically gets darker with warming. And we're also going to look at hydroclimate responses like CO2 fertilization, where for a given amount of biomass, plants transpire less water at higher CO2, which tends to increase runoff. Now, these feedbacks and responses, they matter because how temperature and precipitation respond to CO2 influences how weathering responds to CO2. And so we're going to look at how changes in those temperature and runoff responses lead to changes in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. The strength of the silicate weathering feedback is basically how sensitive silicate weathering fluxes are to a change in CO2. So in this conceptual diagram on the top, when silicate weathering fluxes change a lot for a given change in CO2, that can be interpreted as a stronger silicate weathering feedback. That would be one of the steeper lines on this plot. If the silicate weathering fluxes don't change as much, that's a weaker feedback. Now this is important because we're going to see a lot of plots today that cross plot the silicate weathering flux versus atmospheric CO2 in the modeling simulations. And what we want to keep in mind is that when the data points change uh, more significantly or are steeper in these plots, that's a stronger feedback. And when they're shallower, that's a weaker feedback. Now, the utility of the modeling approach that we have is that we can look at how silicate weathering fluxes respond to CO2 over space. And what that means is that we can kind of map out the strength of the silicate weathering feedback over space. So on the bottom, we're doing uh, a warming experiment where we simply double CO2 and look at uh, in this case, just qualitatively, the change in runoff and the change in weathering fluxes. What we see on the left panel is that the change in runoff is highest um, and positive in the tropics, suggesting that uh, increases in runoff are strongest in the tropics. And on the right, we see that the change in weathering flux, remember, this is basically an indicator of the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. Uh, the change in the weathering flux or the strength of the feedback is also highest in the tropics. Um, it's also high, or at least uh, it's a negative feedback in the mid and high latitudes. We actually see a positive feedback in the subtropics, and what this means is that when things get warmer, uh, weathering fluxes actually decrease in the subtropics in this simulation. So let's look at a very simple case where all that we're going to do is increase CO2 in our model and look at how silicate weathering fluxes change. In this top panel, we see that the curve of the silicate weathering flux versus CO2 plot gets shallower at higher levels of CO2. And this is an indication that the strength of the silicate weathering feedback is decreasing as CO2 increases. In order to understand why this is, we can kind of deconvolve this effect into two co contributions. The first is that as we go from low PCO2, if we look at these bottom plots now, low PCO2 cases have darker lines and high PCO2 cases have lighter lines. On the left, we see that we're looking at a change in temperature versus a change in CO2, and this decreases with higher CO2 levels. So the yellow line is lower than the dark blue line at the top, indicating that temperature is becoming less sensitive to atmospheric CO2 in our model. And this, because temperature is positively related to weathering fluxes, this leads to a decrease in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. But this isn't all of the story. In fact, it's probably not even most of the story. Most of the decrease in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback 
probably has to do with what we're looking at on the right. Here we have a change in weathering fluxes per change in CO2. You can think about this as simply a proxy for the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. We saw this earlier in the top bottom left panel. And what we see is that the strength of this feedback is highest in the tropics, especially when CO2 is low, but it actually gets weaker at higher CO2. And this can be attributed to essentially dilution. The tropics are already weathering a lot. They've approached a thermodynamic limit of weathering. And so adding more water to the tropics with warming is not as efficient at higher temperatures when weathering is already so high. And this decreases the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. In our model, temperature and runoff are two of the main controls on silicate weathering. And what this means is that if we change the temperature or runoff sensitivity to CO2, we'll also change the silicate weathering sensitivity to CO2. And remember, this is really just an indication of the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. So here we're just going to run two experiments where we, we explore this in more detail. Uh, on the top panel here, we introduce a positive radiative feedback. And what this means is basically very similar to the ice albedo feedback. Uh, in this case, all that we're doing is we're saying as the planet gets warmer, it's also going to get darker. Uh, is a very crude representation of the ice albedo feedback. Uh, we introduce a very strong positive feedback to kind of maximize this effect, but it would work if the feedback was weak as well. On the left panel, we see that global temperatures increase a lot more in this yellow line per CO2 than they do in this dark black line. And that's because we've introduced this positive radiative feedback. On the right panel, we're plotting the silicate weathering flux versus atmospheric CO2. And recall that a steeper curve in this space rep represents a stronger silicate weathering feedback. And we see that the change in the temperature sensitivity also leads to a significant increase in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback as we go from the shallower black curve, where we don't have this positive radiative feedback, to the dashed yellow curve, where we do have this positive radiative feedback. Now in the bottom, we are going to introduce an experiment that kind of simulates the effect of CO2 fertilization. The idea here is that as CO2 increases, plants don't need as much water to fix the same amount of carbon, and therefore less of that water is going to be partitioned to transpiration, and more of that water is going to go to runoff. So runoff is going to increase more than it already does with CO2 because of this effect. Now, uh, intuitively, this doesn't affect temperature at all. All that we're doing is changing the partitioning to runoff. So on the left, we see that both experiments plot exactly at the same points in terms of the temperature to CO2 relationship. On the right, though, silicate weathering fluxes increase for a given CO2, um, reflecting an increase in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback, again, because of this effect, where runoff is now more sensitive to CO2 due to silicate, or sorry, due to CO2 fertilization. The main takeaway here is that if temperature is more sensitive to CO2, as in the top panel, we'll see an apparent increase in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. And if runoff is more sensitive to CO2, as in the bottom panel, we'll also see an increase in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback. So with the intuition that we've gleaned from the bottom right box of this poster, we can now dive into some more concrete experiments uh, looking at the Earth system. And the first is a case study on the ice albedo feedback. This is a positive radiative feedback that basically works in such that when you increase atmospheric CO2, you melt more ice, which on average makes the global land surface darker and leads to more warming, which can lead to more ice melt and more warming and so on and so forth. And that's the, the essence of this positive feedback. Um, we're using a very idealized land surface here so that we don't have any kind of weird effects that show up from, uh, from, from just the geography alone. This is a symmetrical planet, essentially. And what we find here on the right uh, panel is that when we plot the silicate weathering flux versus atmospheric CO2, when we have large ice sheets, basically below 350 ppm, we have a, a steeper curve reflecting a stronger uh, silicate weathering feedback. We have a shallower curve in a hothouse climate above 350 ppm, um, reflecting a weaker silicate weathering feedback. Now, in this case, the model was tuned so that you have an ice house greenhouse transition at 350 ppm. Um, interpreting the point of that transition is, is beyond the scope uh, of what we're talking about here. The main point is that the feedback strength increases in an ice house world because of the positive radiative feedback. In essence, temperature is more sensitive to CO2 uh, due to this feedback that we have associated with the ice sheets. 
We have another effect that also increases the strength of the silicate weathering feedback as well. And this is the increase in land area. So as we melt ice sheets at either pole, we're going to have more land area available to, to weather rock. Um, in the model, when we have an ice sheet over that rock, we basically say that it's not weathering anything at all. And that's a very simplified assumption, um, but it's what leads to even a steeper curve in silicate weathering flux versus atmospheric CO2 in our model. Uh, however, most of the, the steepening of that curve from the ice house to hot house transition can be attributed to the positive radiated feedback. The main point of this case study is just to say that all else being equal, the silicate weathering feedback should be stronger in an ice house world because the ice albedo feedback makes temperature more sensitive to CO2, and therefore runoff and weathering will also be more sensitive to atmospheric CO2. In case study number two, we're going to increase CO2 in two different sets of experiments. In the first set, we're going to use essentially modern conditions where we have the northern hemisphere subtropics being mostly deserted. Uh, this uses the modern geography and the modern spatial distribution of albedo. Um, this is kind of our control simulation. And in the right simulation, we're going to make the northern hemisphere subtropics darker. Now, this is somewhat similar to what many have proposed was might have been the case for much of the Cenozoic, specifically before the Tortonian, which was in the Miocene about 11 to 7 million years ago. Um, the main idea here is that much of the land surface is now darker and the spatial pattern of albedo is going to change. So in this middle panel, we're going to look at the global temperature and silicate weathering flux responses to atmospheric CO2. Uh, in the global temperature plot on the left, the desert subtropic scenario is the dark line, and the vegetated sub subtropic scenario is the yellow line. Um, what we see is that simply going from uh, a desert subtropics to a vegetated subtropics leads to an increase in global temperatures. And this makes sense, right? What we're really doing is we're decreasing planetary albedo, and decreasing planetary albedo will, should lead to warming. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that the increase is quite substantial. Just decreasing albedo in the subtropics uh, is about the same effect um, as in, within the desert subtropic simulations, increasing CO2 of roughly 200 ppm from about 370 to 570. So that's a substantial increase in CO2 that can have the same effect on global temperatures as making the subtropics a little bit darker and making them vegetated. Now, the interesting thing is that that change in, even though the change in global temperature is the same between increasing CO2 by 200 or making the subtropics darker, the increase in the weathering flux is not the same. So if we increase CO2 by 200, we do see an increase in the weathering flux, but that doesn't explain the full difference between the weathering flux in the desert subtropic scenario versus the vegetated subtropic scenario. Uh, instead, we need an additional con contribution to the increase in weathering, and that has to do with the spatial distribution of land. Essentially, when we make the subtropics in the northern hemisphere darker, we're pulling more precipitation and therefore more runoff into the northern hemisphere where there's more land mass. And that leads to a further increase in the silicate weathering flux beyond just what we get from the temperature alone. All right, we can kind of see this in the bottom panel, so let's move to the bottom now. Um, what we're plotting is the change in weathering uh, per, essentially per change in CO2. And again, as we've seen before, uh, when values are higher on this plot, this represents a stronger negative silicate weathering feedback. Uh, in the desert subtropic world, we see that the silicate weathering feedback is strongest and most negative in the tropics and also in uh, the northern high latitudes and mid-latitudes. And that's simply because that's where all of, uh, a lot of the land mass is. However, when we vegetate the northern hemisphere subtropics, we see a significant increase in the strength of the silicate weathering feedback and an increase in weathering that happens uh, between about 0 and 11 degrees north latitude. And this simply has to do with the, um, the radiative response of the water cycle to changes in the land surface energy budget. So the main point here is that simply vegetating the subtropics not only has an effect on global temperatures and the silicate weathering fluxes, but it fundamentally changes the spatial distribution of the strength of the silicate weathering feedback.